All right, hi, Philidae here. Um, I want to express some, I wanted to use your model. I find, I find it expressive. It was good. Okay, so first I'll go through the terms as I understood it from your model, right? Okay, so these are uh, propositions of logic um, that are able to fit through these this constraint system. All right, so they fit through that constraint system. On the other hand, there are these which are not meant to be constructions, but are um, those are bigger elements that won't fit through the constraint system, right? You notice they, they do have properties that can be fit together. They work logically in that respect, but they don't pass through the constraint system, right? All right, well, I take Gödel's completeness theorem to be about the little blocks that do fit through the system and the big theories like this. This is a big theory, constructed of things that all fit through the constraint system. The completeness theorem Gödel's completeness, not the incompleteness ones, proves that for first order logic, if you assume the constraint system, every big logical system can be broken down into parts which th fit through that constraint system. In the incompleteness theorems, one and two, it's harder for me to, to, to pretend to be able to characterize them simply. I know there's a corollary from them that says that second order logic is not complete, okay? Because second order logic has statements that can't be passed through its own constraint system. All right, and I'm gonna read some uh, Stanford and Oxford Encyclopedia of Philosophy uh, positions on this in a future video. So, but this is my understanding, all right. So, now, Gödel's, um, I believe more the second incompleteness theorem, it's really about this, the constraint system. It says you can't build the constraint system from these elements that pass through the constraint system, right? You need to bring them from outside that system. So, and for example, some people have proved that you can get around some of Gödel's um, issues by expanding constraints here or there in your logical system. But when you do that, Gödel's incompleteness theorem still applies to that system. And I think what Penrose is saying is, be, is that rather than, ha than doubt our constraint system, it's evidence that there must be some other way we have tested or realized those. And I find it interesting the, um, the way you portrayed the trial and error logic of a biological system. That, that's, I totally, that's how we really do things. And in fact, I think we just do them so much and then we plot it on paper. People used to do square roots by a table that some guy figured out and then wrote it down. You just look it up. Over time, you start to see patterns that make mean that you can look it up on a little tiny table of parameters. Then you recreate those old tables and really it's, it's data reduction. But what I find interesting is that a quantum computer would be good at this because a quantum computer could simulate. It could say, here's what I think might happen. And it could have hundreds or thousands of parameters and it can fold them all out. Now, it still doesn't know that it's really got the right parameter space. It's not like it's going to magically be correct. It, what it means is it could have a kind of a dumb model, but that had, with so many configurations, one of the configurations of parameters fits the situation enough that it's useful and you take the next step right so with that kind of a trial and error process basically is one well you could forget the quantum computing I mean in the sense that all I'm really saying is we come to those constraints by a trial and error process and they're really that must be a good process because they're really good constraints and I do think it's a good model that, you know, you can express the issues uh, in, in uh, Gödel's theorems with that model. So, all right, cheers.